Today's study is long, no? Bruh. But we go. Let's go, let's go. Hi fam, welcome back to my channel. If you're new, welcome. My name is Akubeze and I'm a Christian content creator based in Lagos, Nigeria. Back with another episode of my faith series in which we are studying the great examples of faith listed in Hebrews 11 and deep diving into their faith journeys. And for the past few weeks, we have been studying the faith of Moses and this week we are going even deeper and um, really understanding his faith journey. So if you recall, two weeks ago, we actually studied the faith of Moses' parents. And last week, we got into Moses' faith journey when he grew up. You know, we were told in Hebrews 11, 24 to 27, that by faith, when Moses grew up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and he chose to share the oppression of God's people. You know, he was looking ahead to his great reward, and he left the land of Egypt not fearing the king's anger but really and truly when we studied in depth into exodus we actually discovered that ah, the guy was afraid and he was stuttering and protesting against god's instruction and you know we were hoping that this week we will find more answers into why he is such an example of faith so our anchor scripture for this week is hebrews 11 verse 28 which says that it was by faith that moses commanded the people of israel to keep the passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorposts so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn son already we see a difference because the the description of his faith in this verse talks more about his calling than you know just his own personal feeling and decisions or personal convictions which is what we saw last week you know how he thought it was better to suffer for the sake of christ and all of that that we just ran through um this time he is actually obeying the instruction that god gave him to lead the people out of egypt and um you know it shares how he did go ahead and command the people of israel to keep the passover and to sprinkle blood on their doorposts now um that story is actually contained in exodus 12 but i wanted us to go through the journey from exodus 5 all the way to exodus 12 to really pick up on and you know to really understand the progression of moses's faith from his conviction to his calling so Exodus 5, um, I hope you did the assignment by yourself. I say this every week because I will be skimming through and um, only focusing on the parts that really stood out to me. So, um, you know, please always do the reading by yourself. Get into the word. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you, you know, more than my own understanding could. So Exodus 5, it says, Moses and Aaron speak to Pharaoh. After this presentation to Israel's leaders, Moses and Aaron went and spoke to Pharaoh. They told him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. Is that so, taunted Pharaoh? And who is the Lord? Ooh, the drama has started. Who is the Lord? <laughs> Why should I listen to him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord and I will not let Israel go very interesting um you know because at this point i'm reminded about the progression of our faith journey which we started talking about last week you know from your parents faith to your own personal conviction and then this week i think we are building up to your calling so there is a purpose to your faith which is what we see in moses and so his parents faith was enough to carry him for some time but when he grew up he had his own conviction he had his own personal relationship with god you know speaking to him at the burning bush and all of that and then now we come into the story of his calling where his faith actually trickles down into you know benefiting other people as well and so it's interesting to me that we start off this part by seeing pharaoh's lack of faith by saying you know i don't know the lord who is the lord i will not let his people go you know but aaron and moses persisted the god of hebrews has met with us they declare so let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness so we can offer sacrifices to the lord our god if we don't, he will kill us with a plague or with a sword. Pharaoh replied, Moses and Aaron, why are you distracting the people from their tasks? Get back to work. 
Look, there are many of your people in the land and you are stopping them from their work. That same day, Pharaoh sent this order to the Egyptian slave drivers and the Israelite foremen. Do not supply any more straw for making bricks. Make the people get it themselves. They are lazy. That's why they are crying out. Let us go and offer sacrifices to our God. Load them down with more work. Make them sweat. That will teach them to listen to lies. You know, he even thinks that Moses and Aaron are lying about the fact that God has told them that they should come and tell him to let their people go. Like he doesn't get it yet. So the slave drivers come down hard on the Israelites and when the people are faced with this oppression, they obviously are angry at Moses and Aaron. And so we're told in verse 20 that as they left Pharaoh's court, they confronted Moses and Aaron who were waiting outside for them. The four men said to them, may the Lord judge and punish you for making us stink before Pharaoh and his officials. You have put a sword into their hands and excuse to kill us. Then Moses went back to the Lord and protested. Why have you brought all this trouble on your own people, Lord? Why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh as your spokesman, he has been even more brutal to your people and you have done nothing to rescue them. I couldn't, I couldn't help but highlight that part because isn't that so telling of our calling sometimes? Like, you know, when you are obeying the instruction that God has sent you on and you are really living out his word, you can be so frustrated because the result that you're expecting is not what you're getting. Like you would expect that, oh, immediately you go and speak to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, let your people, Pharaoh, let the people go and all will be well and dandy. But no, even more oppression came to the very people that he was trying to intervene for. And, you know, they now started turning on him. And so it's just a reminder to me that in your faith journey, in walking out your calling, you know, there may be some setbacks, there may be some delays, but it does not mean that you are not on the right path. So we get to Exodus 6 and God makes a promise of deliverance. So the Lord told Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh when he feels the force of my strong hand. He will let my people go. In fact, he will force them to leave his land. And God said to Moses, I am Yahweh the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty. But I did not reveal my name, Yahweh, to them. And I reaffirmed my covenant with them. Under its terms, I promised to give them the land of Canaan where they were living as foreigners. At this point, I have to stop because it is another thing that we learned from Moses' faith journey about how we can see different manifestations and different revelations of God. You know, I love the fact that God said, you know, I had revealed myself as El Shaddai to Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. But to you, I'm revealing myself in a new dimension as Yahweh, because I am the Lord Almighty, you know, God of all flesh. And so what you, what God, the God you knew, the God somebody else knows may not be the God that you know, you know, like, but it's God. I don't know. I hope I'm, I hope I'm explaining this well, but that part just stood out to me. And so God told them in verse 5 that you can be sure that I have heard the groans of my people of Israel who are now slaves to the Egyptians. And I'm well aware of my covenant with them. Therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and I will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will bring you into the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as your very own possession. I am the Lord. So Moses told the people of Israel what the Lord had said, but they refused to listen anymore. They had become too discouraged by the, by the brutality of their slavery. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go back to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and tell him to let the people of Israel leave his country. But Lord, Moses objected, this guy that they said he willingly chose to share the oppression of God's people, not be so, Moses stays protesting and objecting. He says, but Lord, my own people won't listen to me anymore. How can I expect Pharaoh to listen? I am such a clumsy speaker, still doubting, still questioning, still protesting, but God remains consistent and God continues to encourage him to fulfill his calling. And like I said, and like we learned last week, you know, your moments of hesitation and your, your should I say slowness, 
does not take away from your calling. It will not like it will not remove you from what god has ordained and destined you to be as you know i like the fact that we they didn't say because i was thinking to myself like how is it that moses was still counted like his calling is still persistent and i believe it's because he kept engaging with god you know they didn't say oh moses he that ran away and decided not to talk to god again like every time he's protesting he's talking to god and that reminds me of prayer like you know when we're in conversation with god obviously him he was having visitations and all of that but for us it's just speaking and reading the word and letting the, the lord and the holy spirit speak to us you know in our own unique ways but to me, when you're deliberating with God, he's not going to, he's not going to turn you away. You know, he's only going to further equip you. And so, of course, it tells us that the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them orders for the Israelites and for Pharaoh. And he commanded them to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. And so it goes through a section where it outlines the ancestors of Moses and Aaron. So I'm just going to skim through that. But verse 28, we are told that when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, he told, he said to him, I'm the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, everything I am telling you. But Moses argued with the Lord saying, I can't do it. I'm such a clumsy speaker. Why should Pharaoh listen to me? repeating this thing again and it is interesting because we know that Moses wrote these books you know Moses wrote the first few books of the bible so he's the one telling us this story in exodus and so to me it is so interesting that he's telling us that see I argued with God he's like he's sharing his own testimony don't think I just willingly went there and it was just a walk in the park and it's so encouraging like you know we've just said that you know, your hesitation, your delay, your dragging your feet, your protesting, your deliberating with God, it's not going to remove you from the calling, you know, um, your calling remains. So we get to Exodus 7 and, um, you know, the Lord said to Moses, pay close attention to this. I will make you seem like God to Pharaoh and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. Tell Aaron everything I commanded you. And Aaron must command Pharaoh to let the people of Israel leave his country. And at this point, it started hitting me the role that Aaron actually played in Moses' faith journey. And, um, you know, last week, I almost saw it as like a weakness. Like, oh, um, you know, Aaron, Moses didn't want to go. So because God was angry, God now told him, okay, just take Aaron with you. But now as as i as i read the this week's reading i really valued aaron as a sidekick to moses like you know every superhero has their sidekick and so aaron really was helpful in moses's faith journey because why didn't god just speak to aaron directly was what i was thinking when he said oh i you will seem like a god and Aaron will be your prophet and tell everything Aaron that I have commanded you. Aaron must command Pharaoh to let the, like he's telling Moses to tell Aaron. And it just made me realize that, you know, there are helpers that will come along as well in your faith journey and that it is not a sign of weakness. It is not a sign of um, inefficiency or, or should I say inability. It is just a blessing from God that you have been blessed with helpers you have been blessed with partners you have been blessed with those who can walk with you on this faith journey to fulfill your calling and so um you know we keep reading and he says that I will make Pharaoh's heart stubborn so I can multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt even then Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you so I will bring down my fist on Egypt then I will rescue my forces my people the Israelites from the land of Egypt with great acts of judgment when I raise my powerful hand and bring out the Israelites the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord now you are seeing the revelation as to why there has been this delay why God is going through this whole long route because there is a purpose to it and there is a knowing that comes from the journey that comes from experiencing the long route you know so Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded them Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 years old when they made their demands to Pharaoh it was interesting to me as well that Aaron was older than Moses and Moses was the one that you know God was sending and you know it just it makes you 
question what you think, who you think your helper can be and who you think your partner can be. The person must not necessarily be younger than you to be, you know, helping you. The person must not necessarily be poorer than you to be helping you. The person must not necessarily be less distinguished than you to be helping you. You know, the older can help the younger. And it just it hit me. So yeah, by verse 10, we are told that Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did what the Lord had commanded them. Aaron threw down, Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his officials, and he became a serpent. Then Pharaoh called in on his own wise men and sorcerers, and these Egyptian magicians did the same thing with their magic. They threw down their staffs, which also became serpents, but Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Pharaoh's heart, however, remained hard. He still refused to listen, just as the Lord had predicted. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn and he still refuses to let the people go. So go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes down to the river. Stand on the bank of the Nile and meet him there. Be sure to take along the staff that turned into a snake and announce to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, see new uh, identification, the God of the Hebrews has sent me to tell you, let my people go so they can worship me in the wilderness. Until now, you have refused to listen to him. So this is what the Lord says. I will show you that I am the Lord. Look, I will strike the water of the Nile with this staff in my hand and the river will turn to blood. The fish in it will all die. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, take your staff and raise your hand over the waters of Egypt, all its rivers. Turn all the water to blood. Everywhere in Egypt, the water will turn to blood. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded them. As Pharaoh and all his officials watched, Aaron raised his staff and struck the water of the Nile. Suddenly the whole river turned to blood. The fish in the river died and the water became so foul that the Egyptians couldn't drink it. There was blood everywhere throughout the land of Egypt. But again, the magicians of Egypt used their magic and they too turned water into blood. So Pharaoh's heart remained hard. He refused to listen to Moses and Aaron just as the Lord had predicted. At this point, I can't help but think about the rise of counterfeits that prop up as you are also trying to walk out and live out your calling, you know, the calling of your faith. And um, let's just keep reading. We'll see more about them. So Exodus 8, we are told that the Lord said to Moses, go back to Pharaoh and announce to him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so they can worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs across your entire land. The Nile River will swarm with frogs. They will come up out of the river and into your palace, even into your bedroom and onto your bed. They will enter the houses of your officials and your people. They will even jump into your ovens and your kneading bowls. Frogs will jump on you and your people and all your officials. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and (laughs) raise the staff in your hand. So Aaron raised the staff in his hand. Again, seeing the value of his helper, his sidekick, you know. But the magicians were able to do the same thing with their magic. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and begged them, plead with the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people. I will let your people go so they can offer sacrifices to the Lord. At this point, I found it very interesting that Pharaoh is now beginning to recognize the power of God. Even though his magicians are doing the same thing, even though the counterfeits are still cropping up, those that know, no. Who don't know, go no, more like it. <laughs> okay, so um, Moses tells him, okay, set the time. Let me know when you want me to pray for you. And Pharaoh said, do it tomorrow. So Moses replied, it will be just like you said. And then you will know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will leave you and your houses and they will remain only in the Nile River. So Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh's palace and Moses cried out to the Lord about the frogs he had inflicted on Pharaoh. And the Lord did just what Moses had predicted. The frogs in the houses, the courtyards, and all the fields died. The Egyptians piled them into great heaps, and a terrible stench filled the land. But when Pharaoh saw that relief had come, he became stubborn. He refused to listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had predicted. Just as the Lord had predicted. So the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, raise your staff and strike the ground. The dust will turn into swarms of gnats throughout the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded them. When Aaron raised his hand and struck the ground with his staff, gnats infested the entire land, covering the Egyptians and their animals. All the dust in the land of Egypt turned into gnats. 
Pharaoh's magicians tried to do the same thing with their secret arts, but this time they failed. Ooh, there is an end to counterfeits. So as you are on your calling, as you are on your journey of faith, as you are living out the purpose that God has for you, you cannot be bothered and stressed out about what is going on around you, the counterfeits that are cropping up around you. You know, just allow God to take care of them because I found it very interesting that Moses and Aaron were never going back to God to say, oh my God, but their magicians are doing the same thing. You know, they just focus on their focus. And when the time came, they failed. The counterfeits failed. So the magicians themselves exclaimed to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart remained hard. He wouldn't listen to them just as the Lord had predicted. Then the Lord told Moses, get up early in the morning and stand in Pharaoh's way as he goes down to the river. Say to him, this is what the Lord says. Let my people go so they can worship me. If you refuse, then I will send swarms of flies on you, your officials, your people and all the houses. The Egyptian homes will be filled with flies. But this time, I will spare the region of Goshen where my people live. No flies will be found there. Then you will know that I am the Lord and that I am present even in the heart of your land. Wow. I will make a clear distinction between my people and your people. This miraculous sign will happen tomorrow. This point about a clear distinction between God's people and other people, it is something that I learned so clearly through this reading and we'll see it come up again. So the Lord did just as he, as he had said, a thick swarm of flies filled Pharaoh's palace and the houses of his officials. And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron, all right, go ahead and offer sacrifices to your God, but do it here in the land. But Moses replied, that wouldn't be right. The Egyptians detest the sacrifices we offer to our Lord. So we must take a three day trip into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, just as he has commanded us. All right, go ahead, Pharaoh replied. I will let you go into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord your God, but don't go too far away. Now hurry and pray for me. See, Pharaoh, Pharaoh is, <laughs> Pharaoh that started off by saying, I do not know the Lord. Now he's asking, pray for me. Are you seeing? Moses answered, as soon as I leave, I will pray to the Lord and tomorrow the swarms of flies will disappear. But I am warning you, Pharaoh, don't lie to us again and refuse to let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses left Pharaoh's palace and pleaded with the Lord to remove all the flies. And the Lord did as Moses asked and caused the swarms of flies to disappear from Pharaoh, his officials and his people. Not a single fly remained. But Pharaoh again became stubborn and refused to let the people go. So by Exodus 9, we get into the plague against livestock. And we are told that the Lord commanded Moses to go back to Pharaoh and tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so they can work worship me. If you continue to hold them and refuse to let them go, the hand of the Lord will strike all your livestock, your horses, donkeys, camels, cattle, sheep, and goats with a deadly plague. But the Lord will again make a distinction between the livestock of the Israelites and that of the Egyptians. Not a single one of Israel's animals will die. And the Lord did just as he had said. The next morning, all the livestock of the Egyptians died and the Israelites didn't lose a single animal. Pharaoh sent his officials to investigate and they discovered that the Israelites had not lost a single animal. But even so, Pharaoh's heart remained stubborn and he still refused to let the people go. Please notice how the counterfeits they have dropped off at this point. But then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of salt from a brick kiln and have Moses toss it into the air while Pharaoh watches. The ashes will spread like fine dust over the whole land of Egypt, causing festering balls to break out on people and animals throughout the land. So they took suit from a brick kiln and went and stood before Pharaoh. As Pharaoh watched, Moses threw the suit into the air and balls broke out on people and animals alike. Even the magicians were unable to stand before Moses because the balls had broken out on them and all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and just as the Lord had predicted to Moses, Pharaoh refused to listen. So, you know, this thing about the Lord hardening Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh refusing to listen to Moses is something that we're going to keep seeing. We've been seeing and we're going to keep seeing, you know, throughout this reading. And it's something that really struck me because last week, I said last week, yesterday, I was reading Samuel and, you know, about Eli's family and how Eli kept talking to his sons to stop stealing the people's sacrifices or whatever. And they didn't listen. And, you know, it's like sometimes... 
in, in the course of your calling, you can be so passionate about something and, you know, you can be so, you can be doing your part and not seeing the result. But from this journey, you really see that, you know, it is God who decides when people are even going to be ready to turn around and when people are going to be ready to embrace what you are trying to offer them, you know. So it's just a point that may be useful to you. And I feel like it particularly stood out to me because I saw it in that reading in someone. I'm seeing it, this theme again about, okay, you may be doing what God has actually called you to do. You may be in the right place at the right time, saying the right thing, but still people are not listening. And it's not, it's not because you're not in alignment. It's not because you're not doing the right thing. It's just because it's not yet time. So we are told that the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so they can worship me. If you don't, I will send more plagues on you and your officials and your people. Then you will know that there is no one like me in all the earth. By now I could have lifted my hand and struck you and your people with a plague to wipe you off the face of the earth, but I have spared you for a purpose, to show you my power and to spread my fame throughout the earth. But still, but you still lord it over my people and refuse to let them go. So tomorrow at this time I will send a hailstorm more devastating than any in the history of Egypt. Quick, order your livestock and servants to come in from the fields to find shelter. Any person or animal left outside will die when the hail falls. Some of Pharaoh's officials were afraid because of what the Lord had said. They quickly brought their servants and livestock in from the fields. But those who paid no attention to the word of the Lord left theirs out in the open. And I thought that's so interesting. You know, like we were just saying, you know, at this point, Pharaoh's heart was still hardened. And clearly some of his officials' hearts were still hardened. But some had started noticing and some had started listening and some had obeyed what God had said, showing that they had actually started believing. And so it's just interesting. Like it just proves like it's not even up to you because they were doing the same, you know, miracles in front of everyone. And some were choosing to listen and some were choosing to ignore. So it's not up to you. Don't take it personal, basically, you know. So, um, you know, the Lord said to Moses, lift up your hand toward the sky so hail may fall on the people, the livestock and all the plants throughout the land of Egypt. So Moses lifted his staff toward the sky and the Lord sent thunder and hail and lightning flashed toward the earth. The Lord sent a tremendous hailstorm against all the land of Egypt. Never in all the history of Egypt had there been a storm like that with such devastating hail and continuous lightning. It left all of Egypt in ruins. The hail struck down everything in the open field. People, animals, and plants alike, even the trees were destroyed. The only place without hail was the region of Goshen, where the people of Israel lived. The distinction. Then Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron. This time I have sinned, he confessed. The Lord is the righteous one, and my people and I are wrong. Away. Are you seeing the difference in this guy that said, I do not know the Lord? Who are you talking about? Who is the Lord? <laughs> Now he's using his own mouth to say, the Lord is the righteous one. Please beg the Lord to end this terrifying thunder and hail. We've had enough. I will let you go. You don't need to stay any longer. All right, Moses replied. As soon as I leave the city, I will leave my hands and pray to the Lord. Then the thunder and hail will stop and you will know that the earth belongs to the Lord. But I know that you and your officials still do not fear the Lord. So Moses left Pharaoh's court and went out of the city. When he lifted his hands to the Lord, the thunder and hail stopped and the downpour ceased. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain, hail and thunder had stopped, he and his officials sinned again and Pharaoh became stubborn again. Because his heart was hard, Pharaoh refused to let the people leave, just as the Lord had predicted through Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, return to Pharaoh and make your demands again. Alma, the consistency that is required for this calling, Shah, just kept going. Then the Lord said to Moses, return to Pharaoh and make your demands again. I have made him and his officials stubborn so I can display my miraculous signs among them. I've also done it so you can tell your children and grandchildren about how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and about the signs I displayed among them. And so you would know that I am the Lord. Do you see the bigger picture, like the, the essence of the long route, the essence of the delay, the essence and why everything worked together for good was so that 
future generations could know so that this legacy, so that me and you can be here discussing this story. If you just said, oh, God has told me, let my people go and he let the people go. They just won't be this sweet, you get. <laughs> so appreciate the journey, y'all. As you're walking out your calling, appreciate your journey. It counts. It will count for something. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says. How long will you refuse to submit to me? Let my people go so they can worship me. If you refuse, watch out for tomorrow. I will bring a swarm of locusts on your country. They will cover the land so that you won't be able to see the ground. They will devour what little is left of your crops after the hailstorm, including all the trees growing in the fields. They will overrun your palaces and the homes of your officials and all the houses in Egypt. Never in the history of Egypt Egypt have your ancestors seen a plague like this one? Pharaoh's officials now came to Pharaoh and appealed to him. How long will you let this man hold us hostage? Let the men go to worship the Lord their God. Don't you realize that Egypt lies in ruins? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. All right, he told them, go and worship the Lord your God. But who exactly will be going with you? Moses replied, we will all go, young and old, our sons and daughters and our flocks and herds. We must all join together in celebrating a festival to the Lord. Pharaoh retorted, the Lord will certainly need to be with you if I let you take your little ones. I can see through your evil plan. Never. Only the men may go and worship the Lord, since that is what you requested. And Pharaoh threw them out of the palace. Then the Lord said to Moses, raise your hand over the land of Egypt to bring on the locusts. Let them cover the land and devour every plant that survived the hailstorm. And Moses raised his staff over Egypt and the Lord caused an east wind to blow over the land all that day and through the night. When morning arrived, the east wind had brought the locusts and the locusts swarmed over the whole land of Egypt, settling in dense swarms from one end of the country to the other. It was the worst locust plague in Egyptian history and there has never been another one like it. Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron. I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you, he confessed. Forgive my sin just this once and plead with the Lord your God to take away this death from me. So Moses left Pharaoh's court and pleaded with the Lord. The Lord responded by shifting the wind and the strong west wind blew the locusts into the Red Sea. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart again, so he refused to let the people go. Then the Lord said to Moses, lift your hand toward heaven and the land of Egypt will be covered with darkness, so thick you can feel it. So Moses lifted his hand to the sky and a deep darkness covered the entire land of Egypt for three days. During all that time, the people could not see each other and no one moved, but there was light as usual where the people of Israel lived. Finally, Pharaoh called for Moses, go and worship the Lord, he said, but leave your flocks and herds here. You may even take your little ones with you. No, Moses said, you must provide us with animals for sacrifices and burnt offerings to the Lord our God. All our livestock must go with us too. Not a hoof can be left behind. We must choose our sacrifices for the Lord our God from among these animals. And we won't know how we are to worship until we get there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart once more and he would not let them go. Get out of here, Pharaoh shouted at Moses. I'm warning you, never come back to see me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Very well, Moses replied, I will never see your face again. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will strike Pharaoh and the land of Egypt with one more blow. After that, Pharaoh will let you leave his country. In fact, he will be so eager to get rid of you that he will force you to all to leave. Tell us the Israelite men and women to ask their Egyptian neighbors for articles of silver and gold. Now the Lord had caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the people of Israel, and Moses was considered a very great man in the land of Egypt, respected by Pharaoh's officials and the Egyptian people alike. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, 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 hey. Are you seeing the change in story? Are you seeing that Moses that ran away because of shame that he had murdered an Egyptian and, you know, the people were talking about him. Even his own people were talking about him and Pharaoh wanted to kill him. He left in shame. Now is this highly respected great man in the land of Egypt. The journey counts for something in your calling, you know. It may seem like, what am I doing? Coming back, talking, going up and down, you know, demonstrating all this demonstration with no result. But you don't know what is brewing underneath, behind the scenes. You don't know what is brewing, how your reputation is changing, how things are just turning around. Like the butterfly effect, you know, it will all just come together in a moment. And you'll be like, what? And, I, and now you're seeing that when they said that, he left without fear of what Pharaoh might do. I was thinking he, it was when he left that first time. But now I'm realizing that, oh, it is 
in this section of his journey, when he left again the last time, when, that was when he left as a great man and without fear, and he willingly chose. I, can you see that, by the way, Moses has not been protesting again at this point. God talks, he they do. The protest has stopped. There's value in, your, in the journey towards your calling. So it says, Moses announced to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, at midnight tonight, I will pass through the heart of Egypt. All the firstborn sons will die in every family in Egypt, from the oldest son of Pharaoh, who sits on his throne, to the oldest son of his lowliest servant girl who grinds the flour. Even the firstborn of all livestock will die. Then a loud wail will rise throughout the land of Egypt, a wail like no one has ever heard before or will ever hear again. But among the Israelites, it will be so peaceful that not even a dog will bark. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. All the officials of Egypt will run to me and fall to the ground before me. Please leave, they will beg. Hurry and take all your followers with you. Only then will I go. Then burning with anger, Moses left Pharaoh. Now the Lord had told Moses earlier, Pharaoh will not listen to you, but then I will do even more mighty miracles in the land of Egypt. And Moses and Aaron performed these miracles in Pharaoh's presence, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he wouldn't let the Israelites leave the country. Hmm. And then we get to Exodus 12. Wow, if you've made it to this part of the video, the Lord will reward you because you've tried. You're serious. <laughs> So we are told about the first Passover. When the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Specific instructions for preparing the meal and specific instructions for eating the meal as well. And so um, they said, these are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed, wear your sandals and carry your walking stick in your hand. Eat the meal with urgency for this is the Lord's Passover. On that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is a day to remember. Each year, from generation to generation, you must celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. This is a law for all time. For seven days, the bread you eat must be made without yeast. On the first day of the festival, remove every trace of yeast from your homes. Anyone who eats bread made with yeast during the seven days of the festival will be cut off from the community of Israel. On the first day of the festival and again on the seventh day, all the people must observe an official day for holy assembly. No work of any kind may be done on these days except on the preparation of food. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread, for it will remind you that I brought your forces out of the land of Egypt on this very day. This festival will be a permanent law for you. Celebrate this day from generation to generation. And so he gave them the regulations and it says that these regulations apply to both the foreigners living among them and to native born israelites then moses called all the elders of israel together and said to them go pick out a lamb or young goat for each of your families and slaughter the passover animal drain the blood into a basin then take a bundle of hyssop branches and dip it into the blood Brush the hyssop across the top and sides of the door frames of your houses, so no one may go through the door until morning. For the Lord will pass through the land to strike down the Egyptians, but when he sees the blood on the top and sides of the door frame, the Lord will pass over your home. He will not permit his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. Remember these instructions are a permanent law that you and your descendants must observe forever. When you enter the land the Lord has promised to give you, you will continue to observe this ceremony. Then your children will ask, what does this ceremony mean? And you will reply, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord, for he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt, and he struck down the Egyptians and spared our families. Isn't this so interesting? You know, the like we just said, the the... The gist, so that the gist can be sweet, you know, so that generations will know about the story, about what God did through you and your journey to your calling. Just appreciate it, you know, there's value in it. When Moses had finished speaking, all the people bowed down to the ground and worshipped. The people that refused to listen to him before, 
<clears throat> so the people of Israel did just as the Lord had commanded through Moses and Aaron. And that night at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn sons in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn son of the prisoner in the dungeon. Even the firstborn of their livestock were killed. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the people of Egypt woke up during the night and loud wailing was heard throughout the land of Egypt. There was not a single house where someone had not died. Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron during the night. Get out, he ordered. Lead my people and take the rest of the Israelites with you. Go and worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you said and be gone. Go, but bless me as you leave. All the Egyptians urged the people of Israel to get out of the land as quickly as possible, for they thought we will all die. The Israelites took their bread dough before yeast was added. They wrapped their kneading boards in their cloaks and carried them on their shoulders, and the people of Israel did as Moses had instructed. They asked the Egyptians for clothings and articles of silver and gold, and the Lord caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the Israelites, and they gave the Israelites whatever they asked for. So they stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. That night, the people of Israel left Ramesses and started for Succoth. There were about 600,000 men and plus all the women and children. A rabble of non-Israelites went with them. I thought that was interesting, you know. There will be people that will come along that you may not even anticipate or expect. That may not even be your own people, you know. But um, they went along. So the people of Israel had lived in Egypt for 430 years. In fact, it was on that last day of the 430th year that all the Lord's forces left the land. On this night, the Lord kept his promise to bring his people out of the land of Egypt. So this night belongs to him and it must be commemorated every year by all the Israelites from generation to generation. And I thought it was interesting where they specified the 430 years. So I remembered like, you know, in Genesis 15, when God told Abraham that you can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land for where they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years, but I will punish the nation that enslaves them, and in the end, they will come away with great wealth. After four generations, your descendants will return here to this land. I was like, wow, God kept his word. 430 years later, but he kept his word. So don't be so stressed about the timeline towards your calling, you know. Just keep going, keep appreciating the journey, and just keep walking with God. At verse 50, we are told that all the people of Israel followed all the Lord's command to Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt like an army. That The end for me just turned like a light bulb off, like, like an army. The fight towards your calling as well. Like it's a fight, it's a battle, it's a war to get towards your calling. And, um, you know, you have to fight the good fight of faith, like we are told. And if you just think that if Moses had relented the first time he doubted, or if even God had given up on Moses the first time he doubted, then where would have been the cause to fight the good fight of faith? But we see that throughout, you know, all the ups and downs, the different plagues and the different demonstrations that happened in this journey towards his calling he did get there and so we can really say that Moses was a good example for faith to show us the value of persistence to show us the value of growth in your faith journey to show us the value of keeping right on going keeping your eyes on the one who is invincible now I see the value in that section in verse 27, you know, Hebrews 11 verse 20, where they said he kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invincible. Because really, he never did see God again after that burning bush incident. We're not told about him seeing anything of God, you know. I don't even know how God was really speaking to him, but he just kept going despite his doubts, despite his um, protests, despite his weaknesses he kept right on going towards his calling he kept right on going you know keeping his eyes on the one who was invisible he kept right on going fighting the good fight of faith so yeah moses i was definitely blessed by moses's faith journey and um for next week we will be studying the faith of a people because isn't that so interesting from moses's parents to moses as a young guy and just his own personal conviction 
then to Moses' calling. And now we now see the blessing, like how it turned into the faith of a people. That will be next week's study. Hebrews eleven twenty nine, and Exodus 13 from verse 17 to 22 and Exodus 14. So um, yeah, I'll see you next week. I hope you were blessed by today's study. And I love you, but never forget Jesus loves you the most. Bye fam.